Hello and welcome to lesson two of Unseen Poetry. We're going to be working on this section of your Literature Paper 2 course for the next few weeks. You are going to need your Unseen Poetry booklet, which was distributed shortly before school broke up. If you don't have that booklet, then there are PDF copies of it on SharePoint. Please don't feel like you need to print it off as we'll be going through the activities within the booklet anyway so you can just complete them within your exercise book. So to understand where this fits into your course, this is an overview of your GCSE in English Literature. You will be studying for two GCSEs in total with English. This is your Literature course. The other one is your Language, GCSE English Language. And for both, you'll be sitting two papers. We have, so far in year 10, covered the entirety of Literature Paper 1. So that's A Christmas Carol and The Merchant of Venice. And we're now starting to work on Literature Paper 2. So if you are in P1, you will have studied Lord of the Flies. That's your modern text. Everybody else, you will be studying An Inspector Calls. That's your modern text. And that's the first question you will answer in Literature Paper 2. Then you will go on to answer a question on the power and conflict poetry, which you will eventually study in Year 11. And the final section of the Literature Paper 2 exam is your unseen poetry questions. So that is Section C, and there are two parts to the unseen poetry section, which we are going to be studying now. So unseen poetry means that you will be given two poems which you won't have studied before in class. So your teacher won't know what the poems are until you've actually finished the exam. You will be answering two questions. The first question is worth 24 marks, so that's your longer response. And it's asking you to analyse one poem and looking at how the poet has used language or form or structure or all of them together to create a meaning which is specified within the question. Your second question is worth eight marks, and this is asking you to compare the first unseen poem with the second unseen poem. It's the shortest question on the paper, and you shouldn't really be aiming to write more than eight or to 10 lines, regardless of the grade that you're aiming for. It's really just looking at the quality of the comparisons that you're making. They're not looking for a really long response for eight marks. In order to help us understand unseen poetry, and I'm really just basing this, um, or aiming this rather, to people who might not necessarily read poetry for fun. So apologies if you do read a lot of poetry or you do write a lot of poetry yourself. I'm just going to start off with an understanding of why people write poetry, because I'm sure that a lot of you only really encounter poetry in your English lessons. And you might have the opinion that it's quite dull and boring. So I'm just going to give you an understanding of why people still write it today. Poetry is older than pretty much any form of entertainment you are familiar with now. Poetry came first and poetry originated in the idea of oral storytelling that you would kind of gather around the campfire. We're going back a lot of years here um, and share experiences and share stories and the idea of rhythm and rhyme that we're familiar with in poetry came from this tradition because you would want people to kind of be able to remember the story. If you're not able to read it and you're not able to go back at what you've just read and you're just listening to something, then repetition and rhythm and rhyme is really useful. Think about all of those nursery rhymes that you listened to when you were a child. I'd imagine you're still able to remember some of them and that's because of the power of rhyme. On the screen is a collection of words and phrases which people who write and read a lot of poetry associate with poetry. And you can see that the biggest words are expression and emotion and freedom, beauty, emotions, feelings, creativity. That is why people write poetry. It isn't to make a really difficult text that's impossible for you to understand. It's actually that they are aiming to express their own individual experiences of life in words and the best poetry is universal and you can pick up a poetry a poem that was written 400 500 years ago 
and still recognise some of the emotions that you feel today, regardless of the massive change in circumstance. And so that is really key when you approach an unseen poem, is if you feel at all anxious about understanding a poem, is just to remind yourself that all this person was aiming to do is to write about a universal experience, some sort of emotion, idea that connects all of us. And so regardless of who you are sitting that exam, there will still be something for you to understand in that poem because you're a human being. These lessons are going to be aiming to help you tackle an unseen poem. And the best way to do that is by developing these three skills. The first is that you are able to read and develop an understanding of an unseen poem. Second is that you're able to identify the key ideas in a poem. And lastly, that you are able to identify the poet's intention, so the impact that the poet wants to have on the reader. You'll notice that at no point here have I mentioned techniques. And in fact, I'm going to actively discourage you from going in looking for techniques that the poet has used. Instead, the best way to approach an unseen poem is to gain that understanding of what the message is and how that connects to the question that you're given within the exam. So the question will give you your first clue to help you tackle that unseen poem. You will be given a particular idea in the poem to focus on. In this question we have in T how does the poet present the speaker's feelings? And the focus that you are going to be reading the poem with is the speaker's feelings. So before you read the poem even, I would suggest you look at the question. And that is your first clue to help you understand the poem. So you're looking at speaker's feelings. So you would then ask yourself, well, what feelings am I familiar with? It's plural, which will show you that they are feeling more than one thing. So they might be feeling lots of emotions, in which case, what emotions are they feeling? So you have your poem. So we have T by Carol Ann Duffy here. And there are three questions on the screen which are really useful to bear in mind when you read an unseen poem. So you're asking yourself who's speaking in the poem, what are they saying and why are they saying it? Always bearing in mind what I was saying before about why people write poetry. That they are aiming to have a message, some sort of meaning that they've learned a lesson and they want to share it with the reader. And it's your job as the reader to kind of bear in mind what that message is and why they are sharing that message. So it might be something about their personal experiences of a particular situation or it might be that they are writing about something that's quite universal. In this case, she's writing about a relationship. There isn't any kind of um, gender mentioned, so we don't know whether it's a woman or a man that she's talking to, and that's where the universality comes from. When I talk about something being universal, I mean that everybody can kind of identify with some part of the poem. And here we're looking at a relationship between two people and how that is expressed through T. So figuring out what the poem means, there are some activities and you may, may find some more useful than others to help you understand what a poem means. Firstly, it's really important to try to figure out any words or phrases in the poem that you don't understand or recognise and try to figure out what they mean by looking at where they're placed within the poem. If you can't figure out what it means, don't panic and instead focus on the parts of the poem that you do understand. What I mean here, in terms of figuring out what they mean, is, for example, the word gunpowder is used in the poem T. And taken out of that poem, I would associate the word gunpowder with Guy Fawkes and explosives and blowing things up. Whereas in the poem, on line 10, it's actually within a list. So we have Jasmine, Gunpowder, Assam, Earl Grey, Ceylon. And I already know, due to the fact that I drink it quite a lot, that Earl Grey is a type of tea. And I've heard that Assam is a type of tea, I've heard of Jasmine tea. And so I'm assuming, based on that context, that Gunpowder is a type of tea. I've never drank Gunpowder tea, 
I've no idea what it tastes like. I'm kind of imagining that it might have little explosive parts to it, but I'm also knowing that tea doesn't really have explosive parts to it. But that's what I mean about figuring out what it means. The second thing to try is to draw pictures next to each stanza or line to help you track the images which the poet is creating within the poem. And this is useful because it's almost like you're creating a mini storyboard. The pictures don't need to be a work of art. They don't need to be understandable by anybody but you. And it's almost just to track the images which the poet is creating to then help you when you are analysing the poem because you're then able to go back and look at what you're imagining and the order you're imagining them in. But also to look at does this same image keep coming up across the poem? And then once you have identified that, is to ask yourself, why would the poet keep repeating this image? So, for instance, in tea, you might be able to guess from the title, the same image of tea keeps coming up, the drink tea. Why? Why is that relevant to their relationship? And use those kind of questions, use that rep repeating image to help you develop your understanding of the meaning of the poem. Lastly is to write a sentence summarising the poem and just to say what it's about. If you are unable to write that sentence, you reread it and you are just looking to be able to say, imagining that a person sitting next to you hadn't read the poem, what would you tell them the poem is about? That's all that is asking you to do. And that's a really, it sounds really simple, but it's actually a really straightforward way of immediately being able to tell if you understand the poem or not. If you don't understand the poem, there is no point continuing to write about the poem if you don't understand it. You're not going to get the marks that you would get if you spent more time now at the planning stages, spending some time trying to figure out what the poem means and then writing less about it than writing a lot of waffle. So once you have figured out what your interpretation of the meaning of the poem is, then reread the poem. And when you are rereading the poem, you're looking for any particular words or phrases which support your interpretation of the poem. Don't forget the title of the poem. The title of the poem is a really significant part of the poem, which is often quite easily to overlook because it's separate from the rest of the poem. But if you think about it, the poet has probably spent the most time thinking about the title of the poem than any other word within that poem because the title is immediately going to tell you something about what that poem is about and really taking the time to think about why they have chosen to call the poem T, for example in this case, is well worth it in interpreting the meaning and message of the poem. So when we're looking at the poet's word choices, we have here, and this is also within your booklet, verbs, nouns and adjectives which are listed or used in the poem. And we're going to take some time now to choose the words which we feel best show the reader the speaker's feelings. So you need to have your interpretation of what the speaker's feelings are in the poem. So my interpretation when I first read this poem is that the speaker feels like they're in love with somebody. So then I would look for words which I would then associate with love. So for instance, I might have sugar. I might have sweetest, I might have smitten, soul, words that we can kind of associate, if not directly, but definitely indirectly. So sugar is often like a term of endearment that you would say to somebody, potentially. I don't know. I don't, but I know other people do. Um, and then you're thinking about what they show you about their feelings. So that there is a sense of a romantic involvement between the speaker and the person that they're talking to. This sense that the tea that they're making for this person is a reflection on their relationship. How well they know this person is reflected in how well they know how the person drinks their tea. If you think about it, when you're making tea for somebody, if you ever do, um, if you know them really well, you don't even need to ask how they make their tea. So if they have milk, two sugars, one sugar, sweetener. Um, whereas when you're making it for the first time and you're getting to know somebody you still need to ask these questions and you might need to ask it several times until you have it memorised. And that's kind of my interpretation of the poem. So who is in the poem is also really important to consider when you're asking yourself what the poem means. 
Um, the easiest way to kind of get across what I mean here is that this is something you do all the time when you look at text message exchanges. If you are looking at a text message and you have no idea who sent it and who they sent it to, there's only so much meaning you can get from that. Whereas if you know who has sent it and the relationship that they have with the person that they've sent it to, it adds another level of meaning to the text message. And it's exactly the same with the poem. If the if we know who the speaker is, we might not. It might be deliberately vague, in which case you're asking yourself why. Um, if we know who they're talking to within the poem, or if they're addressing the reader directly, that's a really personal connection that the reader then has to the speaker in the poem. And you're almost asking yourself then why the poet would choose to have such an intimate connection. And if you're then following on with my interpretation of the poem, it's because it's a love poem that they are directly addressing the reader because the poet wrote this poem with the person that they're with the relation in a relationship in mind. That this is almost like something that they would say to them if they had the courage to say it out loud to them. And they kind of don't because I'm interpreting it as the beginning of the relationship. Um, so in terms of how that would affect my understanding of how the speaker feels, I would then develop my understanding of them being in love with this person and to add a bit more about how they potentially might feel quite nervous sharing their emotions with the person that they're in a relationship with, um, that they might feel almost kind of overwhelmed by how much they want to know about this person that they have in a relationship with that kind of thing you're using your understanding of who the speaker is and the relationships which are presented within the poem to shape your interpretation of the poem so what we're going to do now is just to try and put this down in writing and what I would like you to do is to write a paragraph in your exercise book where you are explaining your interpretation of how the speaker in the poem feels. Within this paragraph, you need to include quotations from the poem. So your quotations should ideally be those words and phrases which you identified previously. An explanation of how those quotations show you that the speaker feels like that. So you might be looking at connotations of particular words, you might be looking at what the words mean, that kind of thing. Um, and an explanation of why Duffy has written the speaker's feelings like that. So, for instance, my why would be that it's at the beginning of a relationship, so they're feeling quite nervous and that they don't necessarily know how to make this person's cup of tea perfectly yet, um, and that's why they feel like that. Your interpretation of a poem might be completely different to mine, and the aim of this activity is to practice putting down in writing what your interpretation of the poem is. So there is going to be an online quiz for you to submit your interpretation of the poem and then next week I will go through what different people have interpreted the poem as meaning and you can kind of get an idea of the huge array some poems have in terms of what people think that they mean and ultimately it's that ability to explain how and why you think it means that is what the examiner is looking for that's what they're going to give you the marks for a uh, final optional activity if you have completed all of these activities with time to spare is to practice those same six steps on a second poem so here, the second poem is called The Secret Place by Dennis Lee. And it's actually just a really nice poem. So even if you don't particularly want to spend a lot of time analysing the poem, just practising reading poetry is really beneficial to developing the skills needed for this unseen poetry unit. Um, so read it through, looking for unfamiliar words, draw pictures of images in the poem, summarise the poem and ask yourself how the speaker feels. Again, this is an optional extra just to practice those skills that are needed for the unseen unit. I hope this lesson has been useful. Please do get in touch with either me, Miss Murphy, or your class teacher if you're unsure of anything that I've said in the poem or if you want to double check any of your ideas or answers.